people that stepped in to try and save these children. Oh, of course. I mean, that's one thing that I got to really stress and praise is our brave men and women. These were men who put literally their lives on the line. They showed amazing courage by running toward gunfire for the singular purpose of trying to save lives. And it is a fact that because of their quick response, getting on the scene, being able to respond to the gunman and eliminate the gunman, they were able to save lives. There were cops arguing with us and we got kind of confrontational. You're scared to get shot? I'll go in with all of them. Yeah, I will, okay. Y'all need to go in, you know, why don't y'all go in? And a lot of other parents were telling them and they were like, it's because we're having to deal with y'all. And we're having to deal with y'all, like blaming us on why they couldn't go in. Bottom line is that law enforcement was there. They did engage immediately. They did contain them in the classroom and they put a tactical stack together, you know, in a very orderly way. And of course, breached and, and, and assaulted the individual. Wait, I'll see if I can talk. Just wait. There's no, there's no active shooting. From the timeline that I've seen, those agents got here as quickly as they possibly could, and they didn't hesitate. They entered that classroom and they took action. We stand in awe of the courageous law enforcement officers, including members of our United States Border Patrol, who ran into danger. For the victims, child called 911. The room is full of victims. They bring honor to law enforcement and to us all. This is what they do every single day. This is who they are. I have messages for PR and Ando and all the law enforcement that were there that day. Turn in your badge and step down. You don't deserve to wear one. Yeah. Got, got it. Yeah. Okay. Hey, from the for the benefit of hindsight, where I'm sitting now. Of course it was not the right decision, it was the wrong decision, period. Any cat catastrophic event, there's always going to be lack of information, but there was also a misinformation in this case. And that's important because, you know, when you arrive on a particular scene, whether you're, whether you're a police officer or a deputy, a constable, whether you're a special agent with, with ATF, with DEA, with HSI, with Border Patrol, it doesn't matter. When you arrive on scene and you see people acting like it's a barricaded subject, Okay, talking like it's a barricaded subject, then it's treated like a barricaded subject. If you, have, if you don't have the information that there's children in the classroom, there's a teachers in the classroom that have been shot, the subject's still in there, and no one is treating those, those individuals, then you have misinformation, and unfortunately misinformation is, is, is costly, and you don't have time for that. So you're saying that on that day you believe some of the officers on the ground, some of the troopers on the ground, some of the deputies, some of the agents may not have had the proper information that they lacked. Well, I know that I know that they lacked the proper information. It's one thing to have a lack of information. That's always the case in situations like this, and there's always a crushing demand. And I'm responsible part of that demand for information as quick as possible because you're holding your breath every time you hear active shooter school. Oh God, this is an elementary school. You just hold your breath and hope it's a hoax. There's just one more hoax that has happened. And, uh, or it, it was isolated and no children were hurt. Uh, and, but that's not the case in this situation. Isn't there also a duty, though, to go find out what the truth is if, if, you're, if you're on the ground? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely there is. And, uh, and that's why it's so important. And that's why the, our profession integrity is so important. You've know, you got to be able to call it like it is. And if there's any culpability, we're looking at our officers, because we're looking at our officers not just in terms of when they arrived and what they did, but also what they didn't do. But is it possible that if they were in the hallway sooner, could they have gotten information, okay, that, that, that would allow us, or at least allow the, the, the counterman in terms of the direction of the time, that it was a barricaded subject, because it was not a barricaded subject. Could they have or should they have, right? Well, I wish they would have had, I'll put it that way. Whether they could have, or is, is a different topic because we're conducting an ongoing investigation 
internally by the Inspector General. I'm going to wait for his conclusions uh, before I make a, a final determination of whether they should have or could have. Sayon, why do you not feel safe at school anymore? Maybe if there's like another shooter, maybe they have like a plan to get to the gate and uh, the cops won't do anything though. They, they won't do anything. There was kids screaming outside. And then my teacher went to the door and then a couple kids and two teachers um, ran into the classroom. One of my classmates said they heard a gunshot. 
A couple minutes later, we were we started crying. Our teacher just said, "Get under your desk." Someone knocked on the door, and then I don't know what happened. And my teacher um looked through the window and opened the door and knew it. And it was uh. That what are those people Border Patrol. Called? Yeah, the was green Border ones? Patrol. They told us to run across the like a like a sidewalk and then we hid behind the truck. I felt scared. News started coming out that there was, at that time, I think 15 children that had, uh, they were dead. So um, yeah, that's when it really started sinking in. It's just a, it's a crazy experience to, to see that, to hear that in your own town. You, you know, several days pass by where you think it's still like a dream. You wake up and there's no way that it could be real, but, you know, it started sinking in more. And just after that, we started fighting, fighting for accountability, trying to get the real story, making sure it wasn't covered up. My name is Velma Lisa Duran. I used to work at Rob Elementary alongside my sister, Irma Linda Garcia, one of the heroic fourth grade teachers who unselfishly and courageously used her body to protect your students from an array of gunfire. I'm in the same environment as my sister was. And so when I see my students, I see her students. I see her students who are now in, imprinted on t-shirts. As I continue this journey, what better platform do I have than being a teacher in the classroom and being able to do as everything and anything possible to protect not just my students, but every student in the United States. It's an important job, and I feel fortunate that I'm able to do that, that I'm able to get up every morning and be able to give my best and enjoy my students, not just teaching them, but loving them and assuring them we're going to do the best thing we can do. Us as adults, we, they deserve. They deserve for us to protect them. Every time I prepare to speak or I even think about this horrible situation we're all in, I speak to her and I feel her presence. I feel their presence with me. And so even though things are difficult and might not be exactly how I want them to be, it's all in God's time. Remember that every single person is a child of God. So as you refuse to do anything to protect innocent citizens, know that you have blood in your hands if you continue to normalize this epidemic. Seeing uh, two children that are, that are tragically killed in that manner makes you feel like someone um, took away your whole life's work, right? So as a pediatrician, you work to grow these children to their full potential, whether it be by making sure they're walking at the right time, talking at the right time, have the right emotions as a teenager, and you know, uh, expressing what they're supposed to. And then for someone to just tragically take that away from you in the blink of an eye, in such a, a destructive, horrible way, it makes you angry. It, it, it pushes you over the edge to say, it's not if I want to do something, I've got to do something. And it's my obligation uh, to do that above almost everybody else because my job as a pediatrician is the well-being of all children. Um, and for me to sit back and do nothing, it, it's almost neglectful at that point. Uh, Anne Marie had an appointment with me that afternoon at 4 p.m. I deal with that nightmare in my brain every single day sometimes, especially when I see pictures of her. And it's just, it's, it's, it's uh, again, that, a no name for that emotion. I don't know what that is called. Um, again, that nauseating, that terror, that chest pain, everything at once. But um, so as you can see, how can you do nothing? You have to do something. Kids dying is not a political issue, right? Um, uh, you have to do the right thing. And, uh, and move the right mountains to save our future, right? So the, the kids are, our kids are everything. Um, and they're gonna be who we are in the next uh, you know, 20 years. Um, but they're not gonna be who we're supposed to be if they're not around to achieve it. I don't like you Valley being associated with the word tragedy. You know, this is my home. It's gonna forever be my home, but this also, what happened is forever gonna be associated with my home and it does hurt. But, you know, through time and through healing, um, we're gonna get through it.
we're not playing just for us. It's not just because of the teams that come. We're not playing because of them either. We're playing because of the 21 lives that were lost. For those 21 lives, we can go out there and do amazing things. We've been working all summer, all, all off season, you know. We, no one's really gave up. Everybody's been pushing, you know. Um, people have big, high expectations for us this season, and we're just here to accomplish it. Football's a real big thing here in Uvalde, you know, small, tight community, and everybody always looks forward to coming out on Friday nights, you know, watching us play, watching us hopefully get the win, you know, and just, it's gonna be real exciting to run out on Friday night. Hopefully you see all the smiles and the joy. Not much physical reps today, right? Because we're inside and all that kind of stuff. Helmets, shoulder pads, tennis shoes, you know, in any year, this is a big football town and, and we're very well supported. But I think this year when people in the community are looking for something to celebrate or a way to kind of bond back together, I think it's going to be very important. And I talk to them all the time about being kids and not putting too much pressure on themselves and not trying to do too much. Just go out and play and be kids like a normal year. <laughs> You've always getting stronger every day. Um, we're out here all out in the middle of nowhere by ourselves and, and we'll, we'll grow back together and we'll be okay. This is Coyote Football! We want to end school shootings, but we cannot do that by making false promises. We need to do more than just pray for the victims and their families. It's time in Texas that we take action to step up and make sure this tragedy is never repeated ever again in the history of the state of Texas. In Texas, we believe in one thing, make it two things action and results. In the aftermath of the horrific shooting at Santa Fe, we had discussions just like what we have are, are having today. Those uh, discussions uh, weren't just uh, for show and for uh, people to go off into the sunset and do nothing. They led to more than 20 laws being signed by me to make sure that the state of Texas was a better, safer place, including our schools for our children. Here are some of them that I passed uh, in, no, no, I'm sorry, the, the legislature passed that I signed uh, in, in the aftermath of Santa Fe. The big one, of course, is the budget that includes multiple funding strategies uh, to help schools be better prepared, uh, to make their schools safer. I come before you this afternoon with a very heavy heart. America is grieving with an evil madman that took the innocent lives of school children this past Tuesday. There are thousands of laws on the books across the country that limit the owning or using of firearms. Laws that have not stopped madmen from carrying out evil acts on innocent people in peaceful communities. In Uvalde, the gunman committed a felony under Texas law before he even pulled the trigger. What he did on campus is capital murder. Well, just as laws didn't stop the killer, we will not let his evil acts stop us from uniting the community that he tried to destroy. Bottom line is mental health is a large contributor to any type of violence or shooting violence. And the state of Texas this past session passed a lot of legislation and provided funding for the state to better address that challenge. We as a state, we as a society, need to do a better job with mental health. Anybody 
who shoots somebody else has a mental health challenge, period. We, have, we as a government need to find a way to target that mental health challenge and do something about it.